merge is scheduled. Inflation down. No, hopefully that continues. Uh, L2 tokens are up. Fee tokens are up. Like not only is ETH bullish and proof of stake bullish, but tokens are also bullish. Bankless Nation, happy second Friday of August. David, what time is it? Oh, Ryan, it's the Friday Bankless Weekly Roll-Up Time, where we cover the entire week of news in crypto, which is always an ambitious endeavor, yet we persevere nonetheless. Ryan, it was a good news week this week. Well, actually, yeah. it was very mixed. Good news it was bad. very, it ended, week started on a bad note, ended on a very, very high note. Yeah, exactly. And so like I missed a lot of the week. So I was over in uh, the UK with my family for vacation. And uh, you know, how I usually say grab your morning coffee. Mm -hmm. In the UK, David, I discovered that coffee means something different than it does in the US. What? Uh, at least it was like, it was more like uh, when I would ask for a coffee, it'd be like, okay, what type of coffee would you like? And the options are like espresso, cappuccino, macchiato. Like it's like an array of coffee beverages. Wait, that feels normal. Not for me, though. Like, in the U.S., if, if you're like, hey, I want a coffee, mm -hmm. then it's, okay, regular coffee. It's like not an espresso coffee? Americano. Yeah, Americano was, was generally the, right. the only yes, option. Okay. Maybe this was just, like, where I was in, um, the, in, in right, kind of the U.K. Right. Or, I don't know. Well, you're from Seattle. That's the coffee yeah. capital of the U.S. Is that what coffee really is? Yeah, I think, well, I think if you go into a coffee store in Seattle and you ask for coffee, then they will continue like, yeah, what, what kind of they coffee will? do you okay. want? Yeah, I think, I think that's normal. It's probably actually definitionally correct. But like yeah. uh, here on the East Coast, David, you can go into any place <laughs> in the U.S. and be like, I'll take a coffee. And they won't ask you like if you want right. an Americano or an they espresso. They give you black, burnt black drip coffee. It, yeah, burnt. And then they will make it a, a beverage by putting cream and sugar in it. If yes, they like. will. Yes, they will. <laughs> anyway, Bankless beverage. Station. Grab your Bankless coffee <laughs> beverage, if you will, uh, and uh, join us for some topics of the week. Number one, David, the merge, the Ethereum merge. It has a date. Woo! Woo! It has the merge has a date. date. We're merging. We're merging. It's, we're, what's the date going to be? Oh, we'll uh, tell you later. We're not going to yeah. tell you right now. Yeah, we're not going to spoil we're that. Gonna that. For later. Uh, also, there's some a big stuff going on with uh, Tornado Cash. Yeah, that's, that's uh, the bad part of this week. What do they do? What's happening uh, there? Tornado, Tornado Cash. Cash. The first ever smart contract on Ethereum is now illegal. There is now an illegal smart contract for U.S. citizens. So if you are a U.S. citizen, congratulations. There's like 40 or 50 smart contracts uh, all associated with Tornado Cash that is illegal for you to touch. I didn't know that smart contracts could become illegal, right? That's, that's news to me. Yeah, it doesn't feel like they could do that constitutionally, but we'll yeah. get into the arguments there. Uh, the last thing is Coinbase just landed a $10 trillion client. Wow. We'll tell you who that wow. is. But of course, you're going to do the roll-up with us. And if you like these roll-ups, you got to make sure you like, subscribe, rate, and review. So like and subscribe if you're looking on YouTube, watching this on YouTube, or rate and review in your podcast player. If you're on mm -hmm. Spotify, by the way, this comes in video form now. So you can get Bankless via video, which is the best way to do a roll-up, is to watch a roll-up, not just listen to it. Um, but of course, with Spotify, now you can do both. So that's pretty cool. Ryan, David. did you know that uh, this last week we uh, received our 2,000th five-star review and then this same week the no merge way. gets a date? No this way. is not a coincidence, Co sir. It, it couldn't be. It Who is that 2,000th uh, of reviewer? <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. Vitalik? I'm sure said something great. Vitalik himself. Great. It's probably Vitalik. Thanks, Vitalik. <laughs> um, all right. Before we get into it, though, we got to talk about relay a quick message from our sponsor and friends at Forda. There have been so many hacks recently, and last year there were a ton of DeFi crypto related hacks, but I think Forda helps with that. What are these guys all about? What do they do? Yeah, Forda does real time mempool and transaction monitoring. So there might be a transaction that is coming for your TVL. If you built a DeFi app with TVL in it, there can be ways to exploit that. Uh, and so Forta can, you can set up a list of parameters for Forta to listen to. And if transactions come in that trigger one of these things that you don't want to be triggered, Forta can zap that transaction. It can front run that transaction and save your contract, your NFT, your, your governance, whatever. So real time security and operational monitoring for over $36 billion in TVL, things like MakerDAO, uh, uh, Bridges, uh, all, all the things that we use, uh, UMA Finance, Poly Network, Compound balancer liquidity of course uh, there's a link in the show notes to get started so you know not only do you need to get your smart contracts audited but you can have an extra layer of defense with something like forda yeah it notifies you in advance you do not want to find out your smart contract has been hacked for millions of dollars on twitter yeah, okay <laughs> forda can that. notify you yeah. of that in advance uh, so you could do something about it um so go check that out david 
Let's get to markets, man. What are the markets saying to us today? Let's talk to Big Daddy Bitcoin. <laughs> markets are happy. Bitcoin's happy. Up a very impressive 8.3%. Started the week at $22,400. Where we are currently is twenty four thousand three hundred dollars, so almost up two thousand dollars. Okay, so we're happy up two thousand dollars in a bear market. That's feeling good. And tell me about ETH. Wow, this yeah. chart's looking bullish. Yeah, that's a that's a eighteen point seven percent up in one week for Ether. What? Started the week at just under sixteen hundred dollars, fifteen thousand ninety two, and we are currently at eighteen thousand ninety. Yesterday, Ryan, right after the uh, Gorley merge which was a success. Uh, we hit 1950, 1950. Wow. Uh, the, yeah. the Gorley merge, uh, by the way, is a test net merge, the last mm -hmm. remaining test net. We're going to talk about that in, in a little bit. So do you think the market is just responding to the, the merge news? If so, that makes me bullish because like the market actually responding to fundamentals is a thing that is relatively rare in crypto. Right. At least I found it rare. Maybe that's my cynic point of view. The market just generally responds to stupid things all of the time. <laughs> Narratives or like fake partnerships or just dumb stuff that happens. It's rare that you actually have a market event that's affecting fundamentals and the market you know, digests that and immediately responds with upward or, or downward price movement. What do you think? Yeah, the, the thing I've noticed about the market lately is that it's been responding positively to positive news and it's not been responding negatively to negative news which is generally indication of what what the mind shift my like the mental mental state of market participants that's is not a bear right market now. that is not a bear market because bear market even when there's really good news and it can be fundamentally good news mm -hmm. nothing happens right or it could continue to drop down but now we're seeing good news and good things are happening to price and that's following fairly rapidly after the good news in a timely, orderly way. Smart market now yeah. and not a bear market, right. maybe. Yeah, I don't think you can say $1,900 Ether is a bear market. I don't think that's... <sighs> that we're you like right to say that? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> All right, but like, uh, still, I, I think most people, if you ask the average crypto investor, they would still say we're in a bear market. But this is starting to feel a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess we'll see what happens. But you know, when ETH is doing things relative to Bitcoin... Uh, we start talking about the flipping <laughs> again, and uh, let's let's take a look at the ETH to Bitcoin ratio, and I'll go back to that uh, that, that flipping chart to see where mm -hmm. we are. So what's the ratio showing this today? Yeah, the ratio is up ten percent in the last week, uh, going from 0 0.0705 to point seven 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 seven. Uh, actually, on screen at seven seven nine six. Uh, but you know, a lot of sevens and sevens are lucky. I've heard sevens are lucky, which means your boy is back in the green in his ETH BTC trade. Look at that! Look at that spike down and then back up. It's like, oh yeah, it's like if you just erase those months and like act like nothing happens. Like, look, we're at, we're back in that trend line. This is great. Yeah. This That's great. great too. I think we made some uh, bankless purchases around the nineteen hundred dollar range too. And I was like, David, it's going to drop further. <laughs> and and I was it like, did. No, no, dude, we got. It. I'm so bullish. The merge is coming. We got to buy at nineteen hundred. <laughs> we got to right buy now. again. Nineteen <laughs> hundred. Let's go back to that opportunity that mm -hmm. uh, ETH afforded us two months ago. Mm -hmm. But anytime the ratio is going this direction, it, like it's, it starts to be a good time to right. look at the actual flipping metrics. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, RatioGang.com. We are fifty percent of the way to the flipping 48.9 48.9 so what is the definition of the flipping by the way mm -hmm. that is eth's market cap exceeds bitcoin's market cap and that's never happened never happened in it came very close in 2017 there was a prophecy right it was like in 2017 it got us to like 70 percent something i think higher than that above. i think it was above like 85 percent. did it okay yeah, so it, it was really and it was maybe a brief spike it was oh it was, it was, very, it was like a spike it was a, it was a wick of a candle yeah it did not stay there very long all right so so what do you think there are there are various events that have been predicted for a possible flipping i know you are a believer in the mm -hmm. eventual flipping at some point in time i am also a believer in uh, the flipping at some point in time. The difference, I think, with uh, hardcore Ethereum bulls, of which David and myself would, would call ourselves for sure, is when they think that will happen. One of the catalyzing events, people have said, could be the actual merge on the back of the Ethereum merge. Maybe the flipping happens you know, somewhere in the, next, in the next few months, potentially. What do you think? I think if it happened in 2022, that would be way faster than expected. Although crypto is known for doing things faster than expected, uh, like recovering out of that bear market, allegedly, knock on wood, um, I think the odds that it happens in 2023 are over 50%. Wow. Yeah. In 2023, that's next in year. Okay? So not yeah, 2020. Yeah. Not what do you think? What are the odds that it happens this year? 
2022? 10 to 15, 10%, 15% seems really high. Odds that it happens uh, 20, by 2025. Oh gosh. Uh, okay. Well, see, the, the the time is always in Ethereum's favor because of the significant reduction of issuance and the significant ETH burn, which we've talked about on the show an infinite number of times. But it's like Ethereum at that point, and a post merge Ethereum, Ethereum just has to wait it out, and eventually, well, un- unless some other blockchain is generating more block space demand than Ethereum, which has never been, no one's gotten anywhere close. Ethereum is just a waiting game in Ethereum's favor to take the number one spot. So, yeah. like, as we go beyond 2023, it just the 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 percentage that it becomes the number one asset in the world in crypto is like approaches 99. percent Are you ignoring the bull catalyst for Bitcoin though? Of which there there's at least one happening there. So 2024, there's going to be happening. Yeah, but of it's the same bull cat. Like the happening and the merge are the same catalyst, and the merge is objectively more powerful by like three orders of magnitude. Not just that, central bankers may like central banks. Maybe El Salvador is one. Uh, you know, sailors going to keep buying. I don't know. There's some other those things are that not with like Bitcoin. those are not catalysts that Bitcoin has a monopoly over. <laughs> Sir, <laughs> so I uh, I agree. Uh, the probability is very high before uh, 2025. I don't know if I'm ready to say like 50 percent in 20 in 2023 because one of us has to be you know the more conservative <laughs> the, one, I guess. <laughs> but like by 2025, David, it's, I'm putting it's, this at yeah. like 90 yeah, percent, 95 percent. I'll, I'll yeah. go conservative though, and I'll say 90 percent. Like, okay. and then by the end of this decade, like 100%. unless it's 100 <laughs> percent. I mean, unless unless we're completely wrong, about discounting some thesis. like weird disaster merge scenario, which I guess you yes. have to do. David and I will quit crypto. If yeah. It's not <laughs> yeah. No. If we're wrong, we just leave. <laughs> yeah, we just leave. Sorry, guys, we were wrong. Bankless is over. We're done now. <laughs> All right. So uh, we talked about that uh, total crypto market cap, though. Um, that's adding some money, right? Yeah, up a bit, a hundred billion dollars. So last uh, last week it was at one point one trillion. We are at one point two trillion. So a hundred yeah. billion dollars on the market cap for crypto this this week. That's pretty nice. That's a pretty lot good. of uh, we're happy billions being added yeah. in the week. Yeah. Um, two tariffs. Two tariffs. He, here's the thing. Here's a mm-hmm. here's a tweak on it, okay? Um, on the ETH bull case, gas prices are down, my friend. Down bad. No, this is right, isn't it? No. Nope, uh, what's the medium it's, gas price this week? It, that, it's that looking? purple one that you want. Oh wait, no, it's the green one above that that, that you want. This one, medium nope. gas price for the week. No, scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. That green one. Oh, distribution. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, what is the transaction distribution for gas? Uh, uh, yeah, ten. We're back up to ten. We went from <laughs> nine to ten. Sick. That was that. That, that, that's the distribution of the average the average day for, guay free for the last seven days is uh, like 10 ish guay okay uh, so block space demand down for ethereum it, it, overall yeah bear mm-hmm. case right all right there's the bear peeking its head why is it down david uh because it's a bear market like people aren't doing their shenanigans and also we're getting better at scale like simultaneously things are scaling more people are on more layer twos and nft volumes are super low uh, and so, like, less la- layer one block space is being consumed. Um, so, yeah, things are just quieter in the in the smart contract space. Okay, so let me throw that bear case uh, by you again, right? Because, like, right. It, it, you know, block space is only going to get more efficient on Ethereum. We have rollups. And then in a post EIP 4844 world, of which, by the way, we talk in depth with Poly, not uh, Polenia. With Polenia. Polenia, excuse me. Yeah. The pseudo-anonymous uh, persona on Twitter who knows so much about roll-ups. That episode's coming out on Monday. Uh, there is a world where like block space becomes very cheap, essentially, mm-hmm. at the data layer on Ethereum, and we're not actually burning as much ETH as we thought. And I guess maybe getting back to that, uh, what price point for Guay are we actually burning ETH? Like, What is kind of the, the break-even burn rate here? Yeah, so we th- we were been saying for the last two weeks that the number is seven, and I think that number came from a his- his- historical number when less people had staked their ether. As more people stake their ether, the amount of ether issuance actually goes up. Uh, so somebody corrected us and said it's actually fifteen, uh, and I verified this with uh, Polenia and so a few others. Fifteen Guay is the ultrasound barrier. So Ryan, if we merged today, we would actually not be. Ultrasound. We uh, would still oh, be issuing ether. We're still inflating more ETH than we're, we're burning. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so we're at nine. So this right. has to go back up to fifteen in yeah. order for us to start the burning right. process. The fire. Yeah. Can the we furnaces. get some? Can we get some Ponzi's back? 
Can, get, <laughs> can we have just, just, just one Ponzi, Ponzi, please? Just all we need. Just for a, a few days, anyway, yeah. like post, post-merge. post Yeah. Uh, this is the math behind that, by the way. Anything you want to say about that from Don? Uh, yeah, j- here's the math if you just want to check it out. Uh, you take the active n- uh, number of active validators on the beacon chain, and then you calculate the square root of that and multiply that by... 0. 0.0239. So that's how you get the number, the ultrasound barrier number. There you go. Bankless is backed by math. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is a, an article from the Defiant. Ethereum gas fees fall to the lowest level in two years. Did you know that? Yeah. Two year yeah. lows? Yeah. So yeah. two years ago, is 2020. Well, the bull market lasted about two years. So that makes sense. <laughs> yes. I guess it's not as dire as it seems, as it right. sounds. Yeah. My, I, I think gas fees will go right back oh, up. Oh, yeah. They definitely come back this up. This is kind of a short term thing and um, probably in a post merge world or even. Like uh, leading up to the merge, we'll, we'll see some mm-hmm. increase. But okay, markets up this week, saw a lot of green candles in Bitcoin and Ether. And it seems like the reason for this is maybe decent CPI numbers. Right? But on the yeah. face of it, it doesn't look decent. So here's breaking from Bloomberg. <laughs> U.S. consumer prices rise 8.5% in July from a year earlier. That sounds bad. But then they also add slower than estimated. <laughs> so maybe good. Maybe good. Okay, so the the trick about this is that actual July inflation was actually reported at zero. So there was zero inflation in the month of July. We have the the prices are the same, like consumer prices or whatever, are the same that they were one month ago. And so it's 8.5% because that is a 12-month lagging indicator. And so that's actually the really, really bullish news is that inflation seemed to have like ran up against a wall and it has not gone higher for at least 30 days in a row. Uh, so, I mean, I would love to see this continue for another month just to have an extra, another data point. But like this is, a, this is the news that you want to see if you want to get bullish. So I think the uh, average analyst expectation was 8.7% inflation, mm-hmm. annual inflation, and it came in at 8.5%. And as you said, there's no month-to-month increase. At least that's what it seems like. So <laughs> let's declare victory. What yeah. move are we looking at here, David? <laughs> yeah, this is the uh, Squid Games uh, guy where uh, on the left, he's looking just like sh- disheveled and like fearful, like 10,000 yards stare. Position. Yeah, fetal Curled position. Up. And the, t- and the uh, caption is March. March of this year, inflation at 8.5%. Like, oh my God, inflation at 8.5%. And now we're in August and we're at eight, inflation's at 8.5% and we're dancing. It's like, all right, <laughs> it's coming down. <laughs> I guess that's what it is. And markets really like this as well. It's not just crypto, but traditional uh, you know, risk on assets, let's say, including stocks. And the TradFi markets seem to be telling us that this is like a mild recession only, that we already kind of dipped and it's looking kind of mild. And Powell does not need to be Volcker in order to curb inflation. Volcker, of course, uh, tightened the monetary pol- policy pretty uh, excessively in the 1980s, and Powell maybe doesn't need to do that, and the soft landing is within sight. It's even possible. So the S&P is uh, up. It's a 50% re- uh, retracement from the June lows of 4,227. And the NASDAQ just bounced 21% from its June lows. This, so, is, this is the moment that the crypto markets also just shot right up. Like Bitcoin went from $23,000 and then uh, like half a day later, it was above 24000 And then that's when Ether was at 1700 And then as soon as this thing annou- was announced, it just shot up to 1850 I mean, some people are saying, David, that the NASDAQ as of yesterday actually entered bull market territory. Once wow, again. we're using the bull market word? Wow. Yeah. People wow. are actually using that term. And the I can't tell B what's, word. you know, um, the, the statement that always remains true, no matter what part you're in in the market cycle is sentiment follows price. Right. And so now we've seen price uh, increase a couple, mm-hmm. couple months in a row. And now the sentiment feels completely different than it did just six mm-hmm. weeks ago. Yeah. And so you wonder how much of that is going to happen. I, uh, I'm not ready to say we're out of the woods yet. But um, I don't know. I'm just feeling pretty bullish this week on the merge. Yeah, maybe that's, I mean, uh, we maybe get that's lower inflation. Like, remember when we had our conversation with um, Luke Grauman and also um, Lynn Alden. Lynn Alden, yeah. So all of our like the takeaway from all of those is that like, yeah, wow, things are looking really bad. But there's like this needle that we can thread that the macro actually turns bullish at the same time that the merge happens. And this uh, so far is the reality playing out, Ryan. They also said that we're going to have multiple dunks in the tank. I remember Lynn Alden making this pretty clear that it's like, it'll look like inflation recovers for right. a period of time and everyone will celebrate and be like, hey, it's good. We're fine. We're back to the good old days again. And then we'll get dunked back in the tank again mm. and inflation will be back and this will happen. 
a few more times over the next decade. So I'm also conscious of that. But uh, I don't know. It's hard not to be bullish in crypto. Well, if right you now. shorten your time frames, Ryan, it's really bullish. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Just buy and hold, okay, people? <laughs> Forget this. Why are we even talking about this week to week, David? But this yeah. this chart also looks good. What are we looking at here? Yeah, this is the TVL chart on layer twos, uh, and so it is also having a bull market. It's been like up 40% in TVL on layer twos in the last like two weeks or so. Uh, so kind of just like the ETH BTC ratio, like it went down bigly. It went from like uh, six or seven billion in, in layer twos down to like under three, under four billion. Uh, but now we are up to six billion uh, in layer twos uh, within striking distance of new highs. And TVL, of course, is like what assets, the total value yeah. of assets all, on these all layer value twos? deposited. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like a uh, assets under management, I guess, like AUM yeah. of these layer twos. That's what it basically means. More talk on TVL a little bit later in this episode, by the way. Um, there also appears to be a lot of money sitting on the sidelines, David. This is a, uh, a list from FinTech Frank of sidelined capital, $23 billion worth. What are we looking at here, David? Yeah, we're looking at a list of all these funds that raise a bunch of money that have not yet deployed it. So A16Z coming in at the top at $7.6 billion in cash. <laughs> That's a lot of cash. Paradigm, $2.5 billion. FTX Ventures, $2 billion. Katie Hahn Ventures, $1.5 billion. Hive, Hivemind, $1.5 billion. It keeps on going. There's a lot of cash out there. Um, this is sadly, all crypto cash. These are crypto funds. Yes, but they they are not necessarily meant for like Bitcoin and Ether. Right. I think they're meant for like startups and investments. Um, Yes. So, I mean, in my mind, I look at this and I'm like, oh, job security for startups. Like funding. Yes. Funding is not yet secured, but there's funding out there. That's one thing I think. The other thing I, I, I think of is, oh, my God, private equity valuations are not going down anytime soon. Right. 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 So yeah. I mean, that's good if you're retail and you can't get in these private round deals anyway. It's like there could be a lot of value on the public side relative to private, mm-hmm. which is right. pretty good. Like Bitcoin right. and ETH might look like good purchases or other DeFi assets uh, that have been tokenized. Um, all right. Did you know we just passed the birthday of Happy EIP birthday. 1559? One year of EIP-1559. As a result of EIP-1559, 2.1% of the total ETH supply has been burnt in the last year. Uh, so that's t- uh, 2.5 million Ether. It's wow. a pretty good amount of Ether. That's a uh, huge amount. That's, that's great. That's great. Um, so like, e- you, know, you know, ultrasound or not, uh, the EIP-1559 is kicking in. It's always going to be bullish. Burning five ETH a minute last year. Wow. Uh, that's kind of the average. Wow. That's, okay, so that's a lot of ETH. The most famous EIP in existence. How many people do you think know what EIP 1559 is? 1559. How many people out there, even just like, let's take crypto people. Give me mm. a percentage of pe- like people you think that oh, percentage? have a crypto oh, that's asset harder. that know that what this EIP is and its significance. I think a good 20 to 30,000 people know EIP 1559. Really? 20 to 30,000 people? That might, be, it? that might be a little high, actually. You think that's high? Yeah, I think that's high. We have more bankless listeners than 20 to 30,000. So There's got to be more than that. Doesn't mean they understand it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I listen to a lot of podcasts with only half my brain. Okay, so like, I, I don't mean like understand it to the depth oh, that no, the number understands it. Yeah, I just oh, mean understand. Oh. Yeah, this is what I mean, David. I mean that like, just like um, Bitcoin has meme like memed that the, the half twenty one million hard cap yeah, yeah. in twenty one million hard cap some of those core numbers how many people do you think I have I have no idea <laughs> I have no idea I think it's still <laughs> probably like ten to twenty percent of all crypto buyers what I'm saying oh, is that's like, low I think it's that though wow <laughs> of people that own crypto there's a lot of people that own crypto I mean they're, yeah, true. they bought like Dogecoin and stuff yeah like they just don't know what EIP 1559 right. is what an EIP is the significance yeah. of like ETH is burning what does that even mean right. there's a lot of there's a lot to this stuff it's it's not simple to understand I think as you have more capital you likely know what EIP 1559 is so on an individual per person basis sure but I think a percentage of I think over 50% of all capital in the crypto industry understands EIP 1559 yeah, that's cool and what's the next EIP the second most famous four, one 4844 four. yeah 
How many people know what that is? Yeah, we'll get we'll get there next. So uh, come, uh, there's also this really cool chart of EIP one five five nine before and after it was included, and just shows really good mechanism design. Like this is what EIP one five five nine was supposed to do. Like on the left side of this green line before EIP one five five nine was introduced, like trend, like the, the estimated gas for inclusion on the Ethereum blockchain was all over the place, super volatile. And on the right side, it's just way more regular, way more efficient. Yeah, there are a few spikes to the upside because of NFT drops, but but it's just a much more stable mechanism. Uh, and overall, it has led to an actual reduction, like a, I think a 10 to 15% reduction of perceived gas prices, as in people overpaying for gas. Uh, really cool chart here. A lot less volatility, you can see, a lot more stability. Mm-hmm. It's really yeah. great. D- David, yeah. what's coming up next? Coming up next in this show, we're going to cover the merge. We're going to tell you when exactly, the exact number that the merge will happen at. We finally <laughs> have it. Uh, so that's going to that's gonna come up next. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, Tornado Cash and the first ever illegal smart contract and how 7.5 out of the $11 billion of TVL on Solana was fake? Question mark? Wow, what a story. What a claim. Uh, so we're going to get into all these stories and more right after we get to some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. Rocket Pool is your friendly, decentralized Ethereum staking protocol. You can stake your ETH with Rocket Pool and get our ETH in return, allowing you to stake your ETH and use it in DeFi at the same time. You can get 4% on your ETH by staking it with Rocket Pool, but you can get even more by running a node. Rocket Pool is the only staking provider that allows anyone to permissionlessly join their network of validating nodes. Running a Rocket Pool node is easier to set up than running a solo node, and you only need 16 ETH to get started. Why would you do this? You get an extra 15% staking commission on the pooled ETH, so your APY is boosted. So if you're bullish ETH staking, you can increase your APY and get some extra tokens by adding your node to the decentralized Rocket Pool network, which currently has over a thousand independent validators. It's yield farming, but with Ethereum nodes. You can get started at rocketpool.net and also join the Rocket Pool community in their Discord. You can find me hanging out there sometimes in the chat, so I'll see you there. MakerDAO is the OG DeFi protocol, the first DeFi protocol to ever exist, even before we called it DeFi. MakerDAO produces DAI, the industry's most battle-tested and resilient stablecoin. Using Maker, you don't need to sell your collateral if you need liquidity. Instead, you can spin up a Maker vault and use your collateral to mint DAI directly. With Maker, the power to mint new money is in your hands. And there's something new in the MakerDAO ecosystem. Every time a new Maker vault is opened, the owner can claim a POAP, which contributes funds to One Tree Planted, an organization with ongoing global reforestation efforts, creating a world where digital participation and the health of our environment can live side by side. Soon, Maker will be present on all chains and layer twos, bringing the biggest and best DeFi credit facility to everywhere there is DeFi. Today, you can mint DAI on Oasis.app, DeFi Saver, or other DeFi protocols that you use. So follow Maker on Twitter, at MakerDAO, and learn from the oldest and most resilient DAO in existence. All right, guys, we are back, and we're talking about the merge. There's been some major updates this week, including we have a merge date we're going to get to that in a moment. But first things first, David, while I was out in the UK, mm-hmm. the Gorley testnet merged. So this is sort of, uh, we, we've called it kind of the, uh, the pre-show or the dress rehearsal for the mainnet Ethereum merge. And it happened mm-hmm. this week. You were actually on the call, I think, hosting the call, yeah. the Bankless YouTube, when it happened. So tell us what happened this week. Yeah, it was, there was like 50 people on the call. Uh, it was a live stream. You can go watch it on the, on the YouTube. But basically, we were all sat on Zoom and watched the Gorley testnet merge. And then it merged. And then we were like, okay, we waited. We, it's, it's a little bit like all these merge, merges are like a little bit like Y2K. You know it's going to happen. Nothing's going to break before that moment. It's the moment afterwards that everyone's interested in. It's like, all right, is there any damage? Like, is everyone okay? Is that anything broken? And so it took a while for us to figure out if anything was broken. There was a there was a, like an oh shit moment, and so like when this thing like wasn't wasn't finalizing or something. But it turned out to be a nothing burger. It turned out to be just like false reporting. And so after like four or five or six hours, people kind of realized like, yo, nothing broke. Nothing. Some people good. were saying like that. I saw some chatter on this. I didn't see any of it live because I was uh, traveling. But like, mm-hmm. um, devs look scared or something at some point. Yeah. Because- right. So like, we, it wasn't. The, there was like something that wasn't finalizing. But it actually was finalizing. It just wasn't reporting that it was finalized on the front end. Something it was something like this, some technical thing that I can't. So like for a while, we're like, oh, it's not finalizing. It's not finalizing. And then people are realizing, no, no, it is finalizing. Uh, and but, so uh, so yeah. overall, it was like successful. Like yeah, big just success. like previous big merges, yep. no issues whatsoever. Yep. No significant issues whatsoever. Uh, and then what happens next? This morning, t- Thursday morning, uh, there was a consensus layer call with all the core devs where they decided the TTD. For the real merge, the TTD is the total terminal difficulty. It's basically like a block height, um, but uh, uh, it's, it is effectively the date 
Uh, so the Emerge date has been decided. The Emerge has been officially announced. It's coming in at a TTD number that's very, very large, but effectively puts us at the trajectory of September we- 15th to 16th. What? There it is. That's the date then, September 15th to 16th. Okay, so so back us into that again. So we mm-hmm. have got this very large number, which is the TD, uh, TTD, and that stands for what Total again? terminal difficulty. It's okay. basically the, a a number that is it's it's basically a number that we're going to approach uh, as the miners do their thing. Uh, it's it's the reason why it's done this way. If you want to find out, there was an episode we uh, recorded with Tim Bago forever ago. Um, but once we hit a terminal total terminal difficulty of that very large number, which doesn't really make any sense, it's basically approximately September fifteenth to sixteenth, Thursday or Friday of that week. Okay, so has the code been activated yet? It's just been selected it's right been now, selected. right? Yes, the correct. TTD, and then it yep. gets activated at what point in time? Yeah, there the, there's these two uh, software updates that will go out for the consensus layer and the execution layer, and then once those nodes get up, uh, updated, people uh, will update their nodes to follow the merge and merge at that particular time. And okay, and so that is approximately uh, September 15th to the 16th. Mm-hmm. So how likely is it to fall on one of those two days versus outside of it? Are we like 90, 95% probability right. that yeah. we're going to be the 15th, 16th? We don't know the time, the exact time we will as it approaches, but we don't know exactly when, but right. it's going to be the 15th or 16th if this um, TTD number holds up. Yeah, it has to do with hash power. So as hash power fluctuates up and down, it will uh, change the actual arrival of that TTD number. Uh, we saw the, the uh, Gorley estimated date, like uh, time, jump around actually kind of quite a lot. So it started at 6 p.m. It went as far as late as midnight. And I was like, damn it, I have to host this thing at midnight. And then it came <laughs> it came forward to 9 and ended up happening at like 940 but like we're talking about fluctuations of hours. I don't know how well that uh, the Gorley testnet translates to the actual proof of work mainnet, but I don't think there's going to be too much fluctuation here. Dude, I can't believe. So September right. 15th to 16th, it's going to happen. We don't know what time of day. We do know we will be on a live stream somewhere yeah. watching this happening. I'm going to be sipping a Vitalik Buterin, <laughs> of course, green tea mixed red with red wine, yeah. all mulled together in mm-hmm. some concoction I've never tasted before. But that's it, man. You're gonna it's going to happen it. in September. I'm going to enjoy it. And I'm going to enjoy the merge. Um, what are you expecting? Like, do you think anything could go wrong here? I mean, there's always a chance. I but just like, don't think so. This is something that has been planned for so long. It's like the, the miners aren't like, oh, they're finally merging. Now let's like mess with them. Like, no, the miners have known about this too. There's not going to be any big shenanigans. We've tested this how many we, times? We've t- tested this a bajillion times. Like, I'm thinking the drama is relatively minimal here. So a successful merge, the 15th to 16th. Call, call on the successful merge, yeah. That's incredible. So there you go, guys. That's the date. Uh, and uh, make sure you tune in to watch, I think, what will be the largest event in crypto, crypto history since yeah. Ethereum was launched. Yeah. Um, I think this will stand out as one of three events that we've seen so far. Launch of Bitcoin, launch of Ethereum, and then merge, which means mm-hmm. getting rid of the proof of work Right. Ethereum chain and merging to the new proof of stake consensus layers, the third largest event in crypto's history, as far as I'm concerned. And I think will be viewed historically through that as well. Um, so significantly. Yeah. Don't miss it. So, uh, it's, a, it's a good time to be in Ethereum. Yes. Other than, but, this, other than this. Yeah, this, this was, <laughs> uh, I, I saw this come through, of, of course, when uh, I was in the UK. It's just like, but I couldn't believe this was happening. So mm-hmm. tell us the headlines. Right. The Treasury apparently has sanctioned the virtual currency mixer Tornado Cash. This is a press release from the U.S. Department of the Treasury website. Can you give us the story? What happened here, David? Yeah, so Treasury, OFAC, uh, which OFAC, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, which is part of the Treasury, put uh, the Tornado Cash smart contracts on like a specially designated like persons list which is weird because it's not a person. So this is the first, uh, we're pretty sure this is the first person to go on like uh, on, on a sanctions list that's not a person. That's just These a smart These are like contract. specific ETH addresses that they're naming, yes. right? Because Con- yeah, specific ETH Ethereum smart addresses. Yep. maps to an ETH address and they put yep. them, the ETH addresses themselves on the list. Right. And what's also weird about this list is that it, it's, uh, it's on the responsibility of the individual to make sure that they are not uh, transacting with somebody on this SDN list. And so if you go out on the street and like hand somebody some cash, 
it's on your responsibility. It's your responsibility to make sure that that person that you're handing cash to is not, not on, on the, the OFAC S- list. is not on the OFAC list because That's the your OFAC responsibility is, as an individual. Who's on the OFAC list? It's like it's like terrorists, terrorists, like, no, yeah, like yeah, exactly, like North Korea, Iran, probably enemies of the state, right? Exactly, uh, and now also tornado cash, uh, and so they can't turn off tornado cash. So what they did is they said, hey, any U.S. citizen that is interacting with Tornado Cash is in violation of the OFAC SDN list. Uh, and that is, can result in criminal penalties. Um, Ryan, did you know that you and I have both interacted with the uh, Tornado Cash contract address since uh, this went on the uh, OFAC list? Well, how so, sir? Because I haven't touched any buttons on anything right. while I was away traveling. Right. Somebody sent us point, and Bankless.eth 0.01 Ether from the Tornado Cash uh, smart contract. So they, the Tornado Cash smart contract since sent David Hoffman.eth, RSA.eth, and Bankless.eth 0.0, uh, 0.1 Ether. And, uh, and now, and as a result of that, we have violated OFAC's SCN list because we have engaged with that contract. How could we be violating when someone sends us right. these transactions? Right. And by the way, it wasn't just us, of course. As right. I read, it was like, you know, it was like A16Z, people, yeah. it was Logan mm-hmm. Paul, yeah. Vitalik Buterin, Jimmy Fallon. Yeah. Jimmy Fallon. Mm-hmm. Like, Somebody, some, I guess a troll or somebody mm-hmm. trying to make a political point, uh, which I understand kind of the motivations, went through and sent right. tokens from Tornado Cash to all of these addresses? Is, yep. is that what happened? Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah, so every, every person that received the money violated OFAC. And the reason why this works is that like, okay, if, if North Korea sends you a check, you don't cash it. You don't cash that. And it says like from North Korea, you don't cash that thing, but North Korea can send you money to your Ethereum address with or without your permission. And so this is where, why this gets uh, incongruent uh, with like other mechanisms of payment that we've had previously. But if North Korea sends like cash in Mm -hmm. the mail to my address, right? Then you violated OFAC. Yeah. Uh If, if I open up my mailbox, I guess if I do what, (laughs) or if it's in my mailbox, they sent it to me. I guess so. Yeah. (laughs) That's kind of the parallel here. Uh And the the challenge with it is because ETH is um, completely fungible. Right. The point one ETH just merges with all of the other ether right. that you that's have all, that's in your wallet. Yeah, in, mm. in your wallet. So it's do we not report like this as revenue? It. The point one ETH that went to Bankless uh, ETH is that? I am not is that revenue any from of the it. Company? I'm not. Li- but I don't know how to not to touch. I don't know right. what to do, David. <laughs> Someone help me. I don't know what to do. I'm just trying to be like uh, you know mm-hmm. a good citizen and not um, go to prison. Right. Uh, so like what? Here's maybe we should read the tweet out from Secretary. Blinken. Anthony Blinken, uh, when this happened, what's he saying here? He says, Con- we'll continue to aggr- uh, aggressively pursue actions against currency mixers laundering virtual currency for criminals. Today, U.S. Treasury sanctioned virtual currency mixer, or mixer Tornado Cash, which has been used to launder money for U.S. sanctioned North Korea state-sponsored cyber hacking group. Um, I did a full show on this, uh, about a 30 to 35 minute long show, uh, new format actually, where I interviewed Jerry Brito from uh, Coin Center and uh, Collins, a, a fantastic crypto lawyer. Uh, so if you just want the full story, on this. Uh, uh, Ryan was out of town, and so I had to do the State of the Nation by myself. Um, but uh, instead of doing the typical just like interview format, I kind of tell the story myself and go in and out of interviews with uh, Collins uh, and Jerry. Uh, so the full story is available on the, on the Bankless YouTube. Uh, crazy story. Crazy story. Okay, so the, the fallout for this, uh, Tornado Cash contracts get listed mm-hmm. in the OFAC list, right? Um, the side story is, you know, some, some trolls, somebody trying to prove a political point, goes and sends a bunch of ETH mm-hmm. to specific kind of influencer type uh, Ethereum addresses, That's including, troll, by yeah. the way, mm-hmm. all of the crypto banks and such. Right. Like yeah. It's just like everybody got this. Right. Everybody who has an ETH address, who has a large account, uh, that's a side story. Then there was some fallout from this as well. So uh, right. Circle, uh, just they, they froze all of the USDC belonging to the unsuspected Tornado, tornado users. Right. Uh, so... so- so yeah, Tornado, tell, tell this. people people put USDC into Tornado Cash because Tornado doesn't only work with Ether. It also works for USDC. Uh, and so people deposit Ether or USDC into Tornado Cash, wait a little bit while it gets mixed up and then withdraw it later. But you have to wait for a while or else it doesn't work. So like all this USDC is sitting in Tornado Cash. And so at the moment that USDC froze that address, 75,000 USDC was frozen in Tornado Cash. And so like, yeah, like USCC, like regulated domiciled US entity, they're not going to like, they're not going to go up against OFAC over $75,000. So they just bent the knee. And like, it's the logical thing to I, do. People uh, were mad at, at Circle and, and right. uh, you know, 
circle for doing this for freezing the USDC, but it's like completely obvious that this is what right. they would do. This is the it, na- it's like, either freeze the account or shut or down their jail. business. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. It's like it's an obvious trade, right? And it, they're going to have to do this because they're kind of regulated in the way that they're. Right. That's what USDC the product is. And so if you didn't realize that about USDC, by the way, that is kind of a regulated regulated stablecoin. It's not at all like right. ETH right. in that way. Then kind of now you know. The, the effects of right. something like this. And also there's something to do with uh, with GitHub as well. So is this a Tornado Cash? Yeah, um, Roman Semenov, he's a Tornado Cash uh, developer who's, who published a lot of the Tornado Cash open source code. His GitHub was suspended. And so the Tornado Cash open source code was pulled down from GitHub, which brings in like First Amendment uh, questions as to whether or not this actually violates speech. Because after all, code is just speech. We, we learned this in the crypto wars of the 70s and, 70s and 80s. And by the way, there are there are uh, court cases establishing code and speech together. Right. This uh, Coach Ber- Bernstein, I believe, versus mm-hmm. um, uh, the U.S. in 2000, kind of established code as speech. So this is also a U.S. legal precedent as well. Um, we should go through the summary. Yeah, this, thread. Is, this is a great summary thread. I'll go ahead and, and read it. Uh, this is from Seth Hurtling. I'll try and do this as fast as possible. This week, U.S. Treasury Department did something <laughs> it's never done before. It sanctioned a piece of code. Weird, right? Specifically, Treasury added the Tornado Cash URL and smart contract as addresses to the special, spe- specially designated nationals and blocked persons list. Tornado Cash is a crypto mixer that allows people to maintain their privacy online. Prior to Tornado Cash, sanctions had only been levied against persons. It is illegal for Americans to transact with any person on the SEN list, due to the legal doctrine of corporate personhood, formal business entities can also be put on the naughty list. However, computer code is neither a natural person nor a legal entity. Code is speech, Bernstein versus the Department of Justice. Similarly, money is speech, or more precisely, what you do with your money is speech. And then he cites two more court cases as well, uh, Buckley versus Valeo and, and Citizens United versus the FEC. The legal doctrine of prior restraint holds a preemptive government censorship is almost always unconstitutional. And even government acts that have been substanti- <clears throat> uh, have a substantial chilling effect, which I've learned is actually a legal phrase, on speech may be unconstitutional. And then he cites another legal court case. Sanction law is a strict liability regime, meaning that if an American transacts with, it with a sanctioned person without out intent or even the knowledge of having done so, they can be sentenced to 30 years in federal prison. Ryan, you and I might be sentenced to 30 years in federal prison. You're smiling yeah. when you say this, but this <laughs> yeah. is not a smiling matter, David. Why are you smiling? Why what, are they going to send all like 200 of us to federal prison for receiving money from Tornado Cash? I don't it think so-, so. It sounds absolutely ridiculous, right. but that is what the letter of the law actually says, does it not? I will not be going to jail, Ryan. You'll drag me kicking and screaming. Anyways, the threat continues. Beyond the likely First Amendment violation, this action also raises raises significant due process concerns and that the code was not afforded adequate notice or opportunity to appeal and individuals may be implicated without the means to comply. While this law does not uh, seem to be in the Treasury's favor, litigation will take years to play out. Treasury knows this. Now, I've seen a lot of discussions essentially saying tornado cash was used by criminals and hackers, so it deserves to be shut down. While I don't support either, let me explain why this reaction misses the point. This is where we get into free free speech stuff. If Treasury had sanctioned the criminals and the hackers that used tornado cash, no problem. But Tornado Cash is an open source code, meaning it's not owned by anyone and is freely available to everyone. It is thus a public good. We enjoy the benefits of public goods and infrastructure every day. The internet, wireless networks, money, banking system, roads and highways, transportation infrastructure. Guess what? Criminals use these every day too. Of course, we should pr- uh, pursue criminal persons who misuse public goods, but we don't sanction SMTP because hackers send phishing emails or I-95 because drug dealers drive on it or cell towers that route ter- terrorist calls. These are not persons, neither is tornado cash. Like highway- emails and highways, tornado cash has been misused by criminals for criminal ends. However, tornado cash is also a tool that enables law-abiding citizens to maintain their privacy on the blockchain for a host of legal purposes, including political speech, like political donations. Uh, Taking this to its logical conclusion, if Treasury can sanction Tornado Cash and can sanction any code, no software is safe. If sanctions are no longer limited to persons, what other objects or information can the government summarily jail you for 30 years for interacting with? Ultimately, there is no freedom without privacy and there can be no democracy without free speech. Privacy and free speech are the bedrock of free and open societies. Make no mistake, this is what Treasury has sanctioned this week. Great thread. Great thread. Great summary. We'll put this together. I think it's the legal counsel of Ledger. Uh, oh, well done. Well done. well done. Well done. Well done. Seth Hertlein. Uh, maybe we should get him on the show. This was yeah. a fantastic thread and right. went through all the issues. I, I, I mean, I, I think we have some more to, to talk about uh, about this, David. But um, before we do, this also had some impact on Maker. 
potentially. There's some chat chatter in the maker governance forms about an emergency shutdown. Other DeFi protocols are asking, what if they get put on the OFAC naughty list? What happens to them? So it's one thing for Tornado to be put on it. Right. But what if maker's core contracts were put right. on the OFAC naughty list because a bad guy decided to use DAI for right. some purpose that the U.S. did not like? Uh, so what are the implications of this? What's actually being considered by Maker? Yeah, so there's a nesting doll of trouble here. So USDC is now frozen in Tornado Cash. Can't use USDC in Tornado Cash. You can put USDC into MakerDAO and mint DAI, and then you can take that DAI oh, and put it in Tornado course. Cash. Jeez. Right. So, rut row. Uh, uh-oh. Uh, and so, like, and, and also, there's like 40% of outstanding die that's backed by USDC. So, if you if Circle was told by Treasury that they need to blacklist the Maker DAO USDC address because it that has would, something tainted from Tornado Cash, yeah, yeah, or, or it just enables usage of it, right? Wow. So, like, you can. So, like, it, it's kind of similar to like I could I could spin up a contract. I could make it, write a contract that interacts with Tornado Cash on my behalf, and then I could send my Ether or U or Dai into that contract, and then that contract can go talk to Tornado Cash, and my addresses haven't touched Tornado Cash, so I'm free and clear. But the proxy address did go touch Tornado Cash. That's basically USDC and MakerDAO. Is you can take USDC, go to MakerDAO, just use MakerDAO to talk to Tornado Cash. It's the same, same. So like, is Treasury really gonna let that go? Like rut row. Uh, and so this has been caused a great cause of concern in the Maker Discord. Uh, and so they are now like more aggressively prioritizing how to become much less dominant of USDC lately. Yeah, including I think so. There's um, yeah. How much how much die is backed by uh, USDC, David, right now? There is three point five six billion dollars of USDC in MakerDAO, which is like it'd be one thing if it was just you know a smaller amount, but it's hard to like you know swap out three point five billion dollars. This has been a, a known challenge that the die has had, right? Which is like right. it's it's trading off some scalability for some decrease in uh, censorship resistance. Yeah. And the way to get pure censorship resistance and scalability on Ethereum is you actually have to use ETH, which is the only, you know, right. the most uncensorable uh, store of value asset in order to back all of your DAI. And of course, they went the multi-collateral route, which makes sense for the product. But, um, you know, you could, you could swap something else out if, uh, if needed. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess... What do you think about this? Like, for, first of all, why do you think Treasury is, is doing this? Do you think it, this is partially because um, North Korea essentially right. has hacked? They've been involved, implicated in a number of bridge hacks recently, and they have used Tornado Cash to uh, try to anonymize right. their ill-gotten gains. And so now Treasury and now U.S. national right. security apparatus is taking a very cl close look at Tornado Cash. And so they've just said no one can use this. If you're a U.S. citizen, you right. just can't use these contracts anymore. Is this where this, all of this ire is coming from? Because Tornado Cash has been in existence for like I don't know, three years, yeah, something like time. this. And Zcash yeah. even longer, which is right. privacy enabled cryptocurrency. Yeah, this, uh, the implications of this are significant. And may, may, people are mainly asking, all right, where does this go next? Um, uh, how many more smart contracts are going to become, like, quote, unquote, illegal? Uh, I, it's, it's, it's kind of unfortunate that Tornado Cash, I asked Alex uh, Svanovic from Nansen, like, how much of Tornado Cash funds is, like, illicit, deemed illicit? Uh, and he came back to me with a number of 35% of funds going through Tornado Cash is stuff that we know came from like bridge hacks and some sort of hacks. But Ryan, that's just what we know about. So like could be as much as 50% of the money flowing through Tornado Cash is like illegal or illicit, which makes so it really so hard to defend. So it's not that they're wrong, that it is, right. is that it, it, there is some illicit activity, illegal activity right. on it. It's there's not uh, there's more than just like a little. There's like quite a, quite a lot. Um, but the precedent that this mm -hmm. sets and the it's, implication it's that anyone using Tornado Cash is is guilty. I mean, mm -hmm. at its core, t Tornado Cash is just a uh, service that allows you to have privacy. Right. Uh, I, I had to take as, as I was thinking about this a little bit and the implications of um, how I feel uh, as you know, somebody who received some funds from Tornado Cash that were just sent to me, right. is they're trying to make you feel like a criminal for wanting basic privacy. Right. At its core, that's what Tornado Cash is doing. Uh, and I don't think that's a radical thing for us to want the same sort of privacy anonymization that we have in the real world with cash. If I were to pay you a cash payment, David, um, 
Like no one needs to know about that. The government right. doesn't have to record that in a ledger, the amount that I gave you. I don't ha- you don't have to identify yourself to me. I don't have to identify yourself to me. If I, if I give you some gold, there's no sort of registry that needs to be created. And it's not radical for us to want digital privacy, it, privacy on our digital transactions. What I do think is radical about the way Treasury has gone about doing that, this, is that an unelected surveillance bureau, that's what Treasury is, their branch, the executive branch, they're unelected and they are a surveillance bureau and they can make privacy illegal. I think this is normalizing tyranny. Right. If we, yep. if we let this go, because what privacy tools do they suggest we use? Right. If not public good co- code like Tornado. If I want to have some sort of um, privacy on my crypto transactions, what tool do I use, Treasury? Right. Are they right. just saying we can't use any of it as an American citizen? Sorry, privacy is more not or less. An they're saying that you? more or less is exactly what you're saying. Because How is that the reason defensible? the reason why Tornado Cash is being used by criminals is because it's really good at offering individuals privacy, and so it's not it's not like criminals would be able to use Tornado Cash. In, in silo, right? If only criminals were using Tornado Cash, you would just like, okay, well, it's criminals going in, therefore criminals going out. But it's because Tornado Cash is useful to individuals and it's because it does provide privacy to individuals that it, that's actually what enables the fact that criminals and, and, and you know, hijack uh, ha- hackers can use this. Because they, they, they can't use Tornado Cash without there being a crowd to hide in. So it's a very important order of operations. As the individuals, just like you and you and me and people who don't want to have the eyes of the world upon their financial history to like see what they're up to, they use Tornado Cash. And that gives the option of criminals to use Tornado Cash because, because they couldn't use it without you know, normal people also using it. But the normal people come first, which makes that ours, Ryan, in my mind. Yeah, and and the other piece about this, of course, that's indefensible is the the breach of First Amendment rights, which right. is you know freedom of speech, right? And uh, so, uh, if if governments can start shutting down Gitcoin or uh, sorry, Git, GitHub repos of developers for writing code, that's a scary prospect. That that brings up some dystopian ideology. So, I'm still kind of. Uh, trying to figure out what we do as a crypto industry to right. react against this. Have you identified any sort of action steps, things we can do? I mean, is, is Treasury going to get sued at some point? Who can sue I them so. for this? Uh, I, I guess we have to settle this in courts. Yeah, we also, settle it in courts. Also, legislation, yep. crypto-friendly uh, politician, you know, politicians that want to respect and embed in our legal protocols a... Um, basically digital rights, which is a thing we, I think, as Americans and probably everyone across the world do not mm-hmm. have embedded right. in our legal protocols. We have, no, we have no digital rights at this point. We have right. to ultimately find politicians, support politicians who will write laws mm-hmm. in order to protect and enforce our, our digital rights. But for now, like we have a First Amendment, at least mm-hmm. in the U.S., with freedom of speech, and this should fall under that. So what do we do with all of this data? Yeah. The, the good thing is that we've done this before. The crypto- cryptography wars of the 70s and 80s was more or less the same fight, where the uh, United States of America wanted to make code illegal, and the cryptographers won the fight by saying, no, code is free speech. We're basically revisiting the same exact... There's already legal precedent for this. The only difference now is now there's money. Now it's not cryptography. Now it's cryptocurrency. So we're going to, like, we're you know, Ryan, we speed run the history of money and finance and now also law uh and we've done this before and we'll do it again it's just going to be like yeah we're going to have to like every time they take away our rights we're going to have to fight for them back but crypto people fight for their territory right this is our home so you are uh, are you optimistic that we'll be able to yeah. kind of like oh, fight God, this yeah. and yeah. get this right. sort of yeah. stuff overturned in the same way yeah. that you know we did with the the previous crypto wars or do you think yeah. the u.s has passed that point when it comes to finance and money transactions like because every every single uh democracy, Western liberal democracy is going to have to contend with this because right. these privacy tools are not going away. Right. No, and th- that's the other thing is like so many privacy tools are going to like, it's going to be whack-a-mole. What you, do we do? They're not going to be able to ban them all. Aztec right. layer two, complete yeah. L- layer yeah. two, which is, uh, I believe it's EVM compatible as well. And privacy for, it's not. is not quite, but okay. So no. But like privacy for everything you put inside of Aztec, is that illegal? Are Americans mm-hmm. just banned yeah. from legally using uh, crypto privacy tools. How, how is how is how is right. that? Right. The only way for them to make a, a ruling that satisfies their actual desires is just to say like, your, all transactions on a blockchain need to be fully traceable, 
and at that point, it's like, well, you're banning it. Ethereum. Yeah, you're which, banning, which goes right. to the question of where does this stop, David? Right, right. because like t- today we we find the Tornado Cash uh, smart contracts on the ban list. Tomorrow mm-hmm. is it Uniswap? Right, for yeah. the SEC. Yeah, sure. I mean, like the SEC or OFAC. Just let, let let's say. Uh, Let's say North Korea uses Uniswap for some transactions. I'm sure, they do. In fact, on the back of this, just to cause, right. cause more chaos, maybe they will. <laughs> maybe, what if what if North Korea became like the dominant LP for like uh, Dai or like Uniswap or Uniswap LP for Ether and USDC? Yeah. What, what if what if they had fifty percent of the liquidity? Look, man, so like all of your away. counter trades are are North Korea. They could be listening to this podcast and getting these these and be types like, oh, of that's ideas. That's a really good idea. <laughs> for real. And so, when does the bank this podcast illegal? What, this is these are the questions I'm asking, right? Like we're going down this Sick. path, and this is a very dystopian path. I, I feel yeah. like we're going down. And it's right. the first time I felt like that with crypto. It's like, oh, okay, we've entered a new territory now. Nation right. states are actually attacking what we're trying to right. do in this space and attacking the freedom of individual citizens as a result. And yeah. uh, I think that's different. This week yeah. has felt different, right? Starting pistol on all of this, David. We got to move on, though. Are you sure? If you, if you want the full story. Uh, you got to go watch the, uh, th- uh, the YouTube video that's already out on the YouTube. Yeah. <sighs> it's hard to move on. Okay. Uh, the fake team that made Solana oh, DeFi oh look God. huge. Let's, what is let's, this speed run, let's speed run this one. Uh, okay. So <laughs> there was this, uh, ecosystem on Solana, uh, that had a bunch of TVL. Uh, it was Saber and a few other like protocols, Sunny Aggregator, uh, and uh, they, there was a dev team behind it, and it had like like ten or like seven billion dollars out of the the ten or twelve billion dollars of Solana TVL. Um, but as it turns out, instead of like a suite of devs and a big community, it was actually just like one guy and his brother with a bunch of sock puppets. Ryan, he's uh, just faking different online yeah. identities. Yeah, uh, and so I'll read some some uh, quotes out from this article. Uh, Coding as 11 purportedly independent developers, Ian, how do you pronounce this name? Uh, Ian Macaliano, Macaliano, um, a 20 something computer whiz from Texas, created a vast web of interlocking DeFi protocols that projected billions of dollars of double counted value onto the Saber ecosystem that temporarily inflated the TVL on Solana as the network was racing towards its zenith last November. The DeFi, uh, the DeFi faithful regarded TVL as the barometer of on chain activity, of course. Uh, so a quote from a blog post that was unreleased, which is how this all this news came about, says that uh, Ian Set wrote, I devised a scheme to maximize Solana's TVL. I would build protocols that stack on top of each other so that a dollar would be counted several times. Ian's ploy worked for a while. By his count, Saber and Sunny compromised seven, comprised $7.5 billion of Solana's $10.5 billion TVL at their peak. Billions of those dollars were double counted between his two protocols. And so there's also the component of fake friends. In public, Ian and his brother Dylan call their anonymous personas friends or friends of friends. <laughs> and he quote from, from Ian, I wanted to make it look like a lot of people were building on our protocol rather than ship 20 disjointed programs as one person. Uh, so they just like spun up 10, 20 developers about the same protocol. Uh, and so this whole entire thing created this narrative that had a substantial role in driving the Solana token price from under $40 in July to a peak of 259 in November of 2021. A significant portion of bullish Solana narrative now seems to be based on a series of deceptions, wrote Coindesk. So TLDR, this guy Ian and his brother built an interwoven DeFi ecosystem on Solana, spun up a bunch of Twitter sock puppets to make people think that there were a lot of devs, attracted a small amount of TVL that would then double, triple, quadruple be counted in the overall TVL of Solana. And what the, really what this whole entire story reveals is that you know less than a, ha- a small handful of people with dishonest intentions can produce like significantly distorted like realities in the crypto markets. And Absolutely they, crazy. They did. This is uh, 7.5 billion of Solana's 10.5 billion TVL at their peak. It was basically faked by this one dude and all of its sock puckets, puppets. And his brother. And his, and his brother. brother. Two people. And what's crazy, I, I guess the implications of this are, um, and we were talking about the, the beginning of this episode, the TVL on uh, layer two. It's very important not to, very important to know that TVL is a very gameable metric at this yeah. point. And there are people who are actively trying to, it is to game it's, it. It's just, a, it's not, when you put Ether in into- Ether is what I mean. Well, not necessarily that too. When you put Ether into Arbitrum or Optimism or whatever, that is TVL. It's how you count it. That's the, 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 what the, the people just forgot to stop double counting all this stuff and really didn't look under the hood. 
Yes. So sloppy counting of it and TVL is only one metric among many, mm-hmm. I think is. And and I guess the other takeaway are um, be careful who you trust online. Right. I don't right. know. Like um <laughs> and on devs are always dubious. Well, it's it's not all like it's not, Satoshi was an Anon dev, right? It's like not always dubious, but like they're not, they're more dubious than a non Anon dev. They can start with a uh, clean slate, clean reputation every time. So I think it's worth saying that um, it, it it should take them longer to establish, you know, trust than a person in the real world who basically you establish your trust over multiple cycles of doing good things. Uh, And that's how you create your, your reputation and your name, a name for yourself. And Anon could just like have one reputation for one account, another for another, uh, so yeah, we have to be careful who we trust, I guess mm-hmm. that is the end state. The, uh, the next coin desk article about this, uh, <laughs> concludes with something really, really funny, uh, quote from the article says further users have now seemingly been abandoned with the uh, Macalinos announcing that they're shifting projects, shifting their focus towards new projects on the upstart Aptos blockchain. <laughs> and so they're just rotating to the new, like faster blockchain. They did it with Solana and they're going to play, right. play the same trick, trick right. with Aptos. So, um, be wary of that. Crypto mm-hmm. Nation, beware that. Um, coming up next, Uniswap is getting a new foundation? All right. Question mark. Tell us All about right. that, David. Also, a brand new Arbitrum train. Arbitrum and Reddit two? is adopting it, it mm. seems like. Uh, Vitalik gives a statement and idea on theory crafting. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about that as well. It's all coming at you. But first, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible. There is a brand new staking feature in the Ledger Live app today. We all like staking the assets that we're bullish on, and now you can stake seven different coins inside the Ledger Live app. Cosmos, Polkadot, Tron, Algorand, Tezos, Solana, and of course, Ethereum. With Ledger Live, you can take money from your bank account, buy your most bullish crypto asset, and stake that asset to its network, all inside the Ledger Live app. Through a partnership with Figment, Ledger also lets you choose which validator you want to stake your assets with. And Ledger is running its own validating nodes, offering a convenient way to participate in network validation, and it even comes with slashing insurance. Ledger Live is truly becoming the battle station for the bankless world, so go download Ledger Live. If you have a ledger already, you probably already have it and get started securely staking your crypto assets. The Layer 2 era is upon us. Ethereum's Layer 2 ecosystem is growing every day, and we need Layer 2 bridges to be fast and efficient in order to live a Layer 2 life. Across is the fastest, cheapest, and most secure cross-chain bridge. With Across, you don't have to worry about high fees or long wait times. Assets are bridged and available for use almost instantaneously. Across's bridges are powered by UMA's optimistic oracle to securely transfer tokens between Layer 2s and Ethereum. Across's critical ecosystem infrastructure and Across V2 has just launched. Their new version focuses on higher capital efficiency, layer two to layer two transfers, and a brand new chain with Polygon, all while prioritizing high security and low fees. You can be a part of Across's story by joining their Discord and using Across for all of your layer two transferring needs. So go to across.to to quickly and securely bridge your assets between Ethereum, Optimism, Polygon, Arbitrum, or Boba networks. And we are back. Coinbase lands a $10 trillion client in BlackRock, providing Aladdin clients access to crypto trading and custody via Coinbase Prime. So Coinbase is going to be the crypto black backend by BlackRock, which is the biggest AUM institution hedge fund ever in the yeah, world. 10, tri- 10 trillion. I, you, can't, tri- you can't catch a bigger fish than that. Yeah, the biggest fish, I guess, entering entering crypto is the mm-hmm. bottom line here. So the, the Coinbase Prime will provide crypto trading, custody, prime brokerages, and reporting capabilities to Aladdin into institutional's client base who are also clients of Coinbase. I don't know what Aladdin is, but something associated with BlackRock. Anyways, uh, Coin, the uh, the equity for Coinbase, up 15% on the news, bouncing off the low, hose, lo, the low lows that it set uh, a couple months ago. That's good because it's been down bad lately. Really can, been really down bad, a, yeah. a bit of... Mm-hmm. Uh, Bullish news. Also got this, David. This is a tweet from Arbitrum. A new dawn is upon us. Arbitrum Nova is now <laughs> live and open to the public. Nova, this is a definition. It's not like Arbitrum 1. It is a new train built on the Arbitrum AnyTrust technology and optimized for social and gaming applications that require ultra-low fees and high security. So this is another instance of Arbitrum. Mm-hmm. It is not the Arbitrum 1 chain. Arbitrum, when they came on the podcast about a year ago, and they were launching the very first Arbitrum chain. They said they could do this. They said they could right. launch other chains as well. It's kind and of I, implied in the Arbitrum 1 name. You know, yeah, one kind of like implies two. two. But this <laughs> is not two. This is Nova, I yeah, guess. Yeah, but it's, it is the second chain, though. <laughs> Arbit, Ar- Arbitrum Nova. Nova means new, I guess. So it's a new chain built mm-hmm. on Arbitrum. And it is for social and gaming applications that need ultra-low fees and mm-hmm. also high security. That's part of the news. The other part of the news is coinc- uh, coinciding with the launch, Reddit 
Reddit will be mm-hmm. migrating community points onto Nova. So of course, Reddit, 400,000 some on daily active users of which I'm one, big fan of Reddit as a social media uh, entity. Um, they are going to be deploying on Nova as well. If you pop the hood on Nova, this is uh, the website. What actually is it, David? So it's a yeah. new chain from Arbitrum Technology. So it's definitely a roll up for game developers and social projects. We know that. Um, what the, the main difference is that you know, the Arbitrum One chain posts all of its data to the main Ethereum chain, and the main Ethereum chain is like where you get a lot of costs for, for rollups. Uh, so Arbitrum Nova has kind of created a committee of entities like Coinbase Cloud, I think is one of them, and there, there's others as well, uh, that instead of uh, the Ethereum blockchain, they're going to post data to uh, this, this committee, right? So Reddit is one of these people, Consensus, FTX, Google Cloud, Offchain Labs, QuickNode, P2P. Uh, and so instead of posting it to Ethereum, they're posting it to all of these entities that can kind of use databases. So it's more centralized, but for gaming and social applications, it doesn't really matter because they're not financial applications, so you don't need as much security. Uh, and the costs are just probably many orders of magnitude cheaper. Uh, so so it's faster, like, cheaper, like and basically zero transaction fees, I would guess. Consensus is still secured on mm-hmm. Ethereum. So consensus is still Ethereum. That's what makes it a roll up. But data mm-hmm. is now not being posted on Ethereum. It's right. being posted to this data availability yeah. commu- committee mm-hmm. run by these this set of organizations. Right. So it's it's almost as secure as Ethereum, but the data part is not quite as secure. Right. So there's a bit of a trade-off, but in exchange for that trade-off, you get a pretty great chain that's right. very cheap for social and gaming right. type applications. That's what it's, Reddit's you, you get a chain that emulates and has the UX of web two. So it's a great place to start for like Reddit, like points, for example, that, you know, you don't need to have like MetaMask pop up and ask for approval. And this know? is kind of like, um, if you're into like roll up terminology, it sounds kind of like a Validium. Yeah. There might be some differences here yeah. and we should probably have uh, Arbitrum uh, tell us more about it at some point. But um, yeah, it's pretty cool and good to see Reddit adoption for sure. Um, this is, by the way, Nova on layer two beat. And Damn. so we look at that TVL Damn. of Nova. Well, from zero to $878,000 inside of seven days. So kind of technically up uh, infinity percent. <laughs> yeah, infinity percent. Still, still under a million dollars. So it's like, <laughs> you got a ways to go. A million like, dollar TVL in seven days is great. Not if all TVL is fake, David. How can we trust TVL anymore? <laughs> Did we just talk about that? How about Uniswap? What are they doing? Yeah, Uniswap's making a foundation. Uh, and so a foundation has always been missing, absent from like the Uniswap ecosystem. There's Uniswap Labs, but that's a for-profit company that doesn't have complete and total alignment with the Uni token. Uniswap mm-hmm. Labs is the thing that uh, acquired the Genie NFT aggregator. But the value of that Genie NFT aggregator doesn't go to the Uni token, it goes to Uniswap Labs. So we need this Uniswap foundation to kind of put like a central thinking head upon the Uniswap DAO. Uh, and so this Uniswap foundation has been proposed. Uh, and so this is just a temperature check, but I'm pretty sure this is going to go through. Um, I, this isn't a direct one-to-one like link, but I think like something like this is a necessary step to turning on the fee switch because... The Uniswap Foundation can have the best interest of the Uni token holders at heart, and the labs can't because of SEC regulations. So bullish. It's bullish. We're, we're trying to fix our governance tokens here mm-hmm. uh, right now. Um, how about MakerDAO? This is uh, pretty interesting news that happened right. last week as well. Yeah, there's an HVB bank minted $25 million in a single transaction. So MakerDAO really leaning into the real world asset, real world collateral, uh, which I've always been bullish on. So congratulations to them. I wonder if this week changed any of that. I know, into no, the real world. it didn't, it didn't, it didn't. It's un- like everyone tries to conflate these things, but it didn't. <laughs> it's, 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 it's interesting though, if like, um, if the US government goes aggro on DeFi, what the fallout will be. I don't think that's where the, well, I don't think we're the there US yet, government though. isn't like a monolith. Uh, it's not, it's like, oh, the, the government's gonna come for MakerDAO. Yeah. Uh, like some specific agency has to get offended by this and I don't think there's, there is one. Plus again, real world, world collateral is not like this centralized thing. It's, it's also decentralized. It's just decentralized in meat space, not in crypto space. And so I mean the fact that these banks could be from any jurisdiction in the world, any jurisdiction. Yeah. Like you're right. US. Yeah. And like, no, there's not one uh, like contract to rule them all. So if you, if you shut down one contract, all the other ones are still standing. Right. So you have to go one by one by one and fight each one in court. It's a different level of different kind of decentralization. The other thing I think that, that makes this bullish and going after real world assets is now you have HV bank 
that mm-hmm. knows about DeFi and is right. an advocate, right? And is right. also going to stand up and fight on the side right. of crypto Big time. in any battles that yeah, are to come. See, you're getting it. You're getting it. Real, no, world, no, I, a, real world assets. It's so it, bullish. It, it, it is. It, and I'm so glad we have all of these experiments mm-hmm. playing out at once because I think um, you know Ethereum crypto is a very big tent. Mm -hmm. Um, Some news from Meta, David. What are we looking at? Instagram has rolled out its NFT support to a bunch of more countries, 100 more uh, countries, uh, and also the Float blockchain. Instagram rolled out their NFT support forever ago. I haven't really like seen anyone been using any of that, but maybe it's because we haven't had 100 more companies (laughs) do stuff with it or countries do stuff with it. Yeah, I don't know. It's a a slower rollout, but uh, we'll see. I think they've got some bigger things planned. Um, David, do you remember all those uh, bankruptcies? Um, This is some news from the bankrupt crypto broker. Voyager, they just approved to return. They've just been approved to return two hundred seventy million dollars to their clients. So I guess if you're a depositor yeah. or maybe a debtor to a, Voyager, like a customer, getting, yeah, like a normal customer, you're getting some money back, yeah. maybe cents mm-hmm. on the dollar. I don't think you're getting all your money back, but I don't know the details of this. Um, it specifically is returning two hundred seventy million dollars to affected customers, ah. and so I think that means retail is getting this before like other creditors or debtors or whatever. I hope so. We'll see. But it's like it's going to work its way out over the months to come, as we said. So we'll see more of this as uh, as they wind out. Uh, this is some news from Immutable as well. And, and the GameStop partnership, mm-hmm. what's happening here? Yeah, yeah, we saw this coming uh, from a mile away. But uh, Immutable uh, X, the layer two, and also GameStop Wallet, the, the wallet, are now integrated. So this, this whole like Immutable GameStop asset gaming ecosystem, it's moving pretty fast. Uh, we're liking what we're seeing here. David, uh, a tweet from Vitalik this week. Uh, some quick theory crafting. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a great word, theory crafting. Right. How much data space we could save by Im- improving compression. So this is Vitalik talking about compression of various ERC-20 tokens. And there's a lot of detail in this slide, but can you dumb it down for us? What are we looking at? Yeah, basically each there's a, a bunch of like bars and each bar is cut up into sections. And it's, it's basically a t- uh, anatomy of a transaction. So you have the nonce and how much data that consumes is like one one section of the bigger bar. You have the priority fee and how much data that is, the gas and how much data that is, the token address and how much data that is. The signature is a really big chunk of this overall data. And you can kind of just see the way that Ethereum scales is not necessarily like adding bigger blocks or shards or more block space. That is one way, but it's also by compressing all the transactions into a smaller packet of data. And so I just thought this visualization by Vitalik shows how much scalability there's left in Ethereum for just a normal ERC-20 transfer. So if, if for the viewers on the YouTube, if you're looking at the top, that's where we are currently. It's this bar that spans the whole entire page. And then at the ideal stateful compression, it goes to a much smaller bar. And so we're at 188 bytes currently for an ERC-20 transaction. And then the ideal stateful compression is 23 bytes. Uh, and so in the future, with all these optimizations, how many times can you fit 23 into 188? Quick math is 8.7 or 8.7. 2 times. Uh, and so with all of these compressions, which have nothing to do with the actual protocol of the blockchain, uh, the actual like block space of the blockchain, we can get eight times more scale in a basic ERC-20 transfer. So I just like this visualization. It's a great visualization, by the way. In that uh, Polenia episode, we talk about scalability in, mm-hmm. in compression, right? And he thinks, uh, sorry, they think with the introduction of EIP-4844 plus compression, mm-hmm. this is the compression that Polenia was talking about. We're going to get in a thousand uh, X increase in roll up transaction throughputs and Ethereum right. transaction throughput. So that's what all this leads to. And compression is an important part mm-hmm. of that story. You know, it's another important part of the crypto story is the jobs market in crypto. Jobs. Jobs market still going strong. David, uh, this is our time to remind the Bankless Nation to do what? To get a job. And actually, you should get a job at Bankless because Bankless has more jobs <laughs> on the job board. Look at that. Podcast oh, oh. editor. We're, we're throwing out more podcast content. So we're going to need a third editor to add to the team. Also, if you know how to make like DeFi tutorials on YouTube, if you're good at like whatever those like Adobe, that's whole suite and you can make good tutorials. We're definitely looking for that. Media operations also at Bankless. Bankless is hiring so many. God, we're hiring so much. Jesus, this is crazy. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, we wait, are. I'm, I'm reading off the jobs right now. That's not what I do. You should Yeah, no, you're jobs. supposed to be dancing right now. So <laughs> I get to dancing, dancing sir. Uh, wait, boardroom if, Labs. If, if, I, is, if I read out the jobs, does that mean you dance? No, it doesn't. It doesn't <laughs> it's not bi-directional, all right? This is a unidirectional <laughs> arrangement here. Uh, boardroom Labs. They are, I, I better start this before I'm uh, asked to dance again. Software engineer, Dow Governance. Also, Manticore Games, a manager of crypto marketing. What is that, David? 
Oh, non-technical. Thanks. <laughs> Bankless, we're also looking for a writer, Vertex Protocol, a marketing coordinator. Uh, still want a senior newsletter editor for Bankless Streams, financial analyst, Bankless Academy, product manager. Wow. I guess it's all Bankless jobs this week, uh, but there are wow. plenty of others. <laughs> Actually, I shouldn't say that. There's a head of marketing, Pleaser Dow. The Sandbox wants a biz dev manager on Juno. Theorem Foundation wants a front-end uh, developer. There's a ton more. Go to the bankless.palette.com mm -hmm. jobs. Uh, URL to get access to those jobs and make sure you sign up to get these jobs via email. Guys, we got a lot more coming up. David, what's, tell them what's coming up next. Oh, we got the question from the nation, how to get the ETH proof of work token if you think that token is valuable. I do not think it will be, but if you do, <laughs> we'll tell you how to get You're it. You're going to get it anyway. You're going <laughs> to get it either anyway. way, whether it's worth zero pennies or whatnot. Uh, also some bridge risk stuff. And of course, the hot takes out of crypto Twitter. So in order to get some of that stuff, you got to go like and subscribe. Uh, you're going to get it anyways, but you should also sit like and subscribe anyways. And we'll be right back after we get through some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. Arbitrum is an Ethereum layer two scaling solution that is going to completely change how we use DeFi and NFTs. Some of the coolest new NFT collections have chosen Arbitrum as their home, while DeFi protocols continue to see increased liquidity and usage. You can now bridge straight into Arbitrum from more than 10 different exchanges, including Binance, FTX, Huobi, and Crypto.com. Once on Arbitrum, you'll enjoy fast transactions with cheap fees, allowing you to explore new frontiers of the crypto universe. New to Arbitrum, for a limited time, you can get Arbitrum NFTs designed by the famous artists Ratwell and Sugoi for joining the Arbitrum Odyssey. The Odyssey is an eight week long event where you complete on-chain activities and receive a free NFT as a reward. Find out more by visiting the Discord at discord.gg slash Arbitrum. You can also bridge your assets to Arbitrum at bridge.arbitrum.io and access all of Arbitrum's apps at portal.arbitrum.io in order to experience DeFi and NFTs the way it was always meant to be, fast, cheap, secure, and friction-free. The Brave browser is the user-first browser for the Web3 internet, with over 60 million monthly active users. And inside the Brave browser, you'll find the Brave wallet, the secure multi-chain crypto wallet built right into the browser. Web3 is freedom from big tech and Wall Street, more control and better privacy, but there's a weak point in Web3, your crypto wallet. And most crypto wallets are browser extensions, which can easily be spoofed. But the Brave wallet is different. No extensions are required, which gives Brave browser an extra level of security versus other wallets. Brave wallet is your secure passport for the possibilities of Web3, and supports multiple chains, including Ethereum and Solana. You can even buy crypto directly inside the wallet with RAMP. And of course, you can store, send, and swap your crypto assets, manage your NFTs, and connect to other wallets and DeFi apps. So whether you're new to crypto or you're a seasoned pro, it's time to ditch those risky extensions, and it's time to switch to the Brave wallet. Download Brave at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. All right, guys, we're back with some questions from the Bankless Nation. That's questions from you. And if you've got a question for the weekly roll-up, make sure you follow Bankless HQ on Twitter. We post uh, a request for questions once a week, and you can get your question answered if you post there. Number one, from Nobody. If there's a proof of work fork at the merge, will you receive the airdrop to a Ledger wallet? I think that's a Ledger wallet specifically. Mm -hmm. Wants to know if this user wants to know if they will receive a uh, part of that token, ETH POW token. Will they, David? Well, you will absolutely, because a ledger wallet means that you have your own private keys. So it's actually less about the ledger and more about do you have your own private keys? And because you have a ledger, you have your own private keys. So the answer is absolutely yes. If you have your own private keys, then you will get that you will be able to access your ether on the proof of work chain. If you have that ether though. Okay. So what happens if you have your ETH at somewhere like Coinbase? Well, so that means you don't have your private keys, which means that is up to Coinbase. And historically, Coinbase has honored forks. Um, and we've seen that happen before. That happened with Bitcoin Cash. So when Bitcoin uh, forked off into Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, Coinbase gave all Bitcoin holders their, their, their owed Bitcoin Cash. The, I mean, but blockchains fork many, many, many times. Uh, and so there have been other forks where Coinbase was like, that's too small of a fork. We don't care about that one. So you didn't get those other forks. Uh, and so, I mean, Coinbase hasn't really taken a position, but if there's enough of like a movement behind the ETH proof of work chain, you could see Coinbase listing <laughs> that, that chain, excuse me. Uh, and then they would give you your ETH proof of work token if they choose, but you're beholden to Coinbase. It's up to Coinbase because you know you trusted them with your keys. I think some other exchanges have signaled that they would support yeah, uh, Poloniex. A, a trading pair. All of the Poloniex. trash train, all the trash exchanges. <laughs> they will, but as long as someone uh, someone does it, then you could sell. Yeah, That's right. how that works. If if you want to sell, you can sell. And by the way, that is taxable income. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, if you're receiving Sick. an airdrop, taxable income. <laughs> nice taxable income for your airdrop. So sell it quickly. <laughs> Um, second question. 
from avigupta.eth. I don't even remember the bridge I used to transfer my funds to layer two, but once funds reach L2, am I still exposed to bridge risk or just the risk of smart contract for L2? So that is once a you bridge, great question. It's a great question. Once you bridge, you still have the risk of the bridge on your assets lingering forever. Yeah, Ryan, can you go to bungee.exchange real quick? Okay, so this is Bungie.exchange. It's like a bridge aggregator plus also a DEX aggregator. So Ryan's got Ethereum to Optimism. He's got 0.044 ETH on one side on the Ethereum chain, and he's asking for 84.8 USDC on the Optimism chain. And so here's all these bridges. On the on the top one, the, this thing automatically selects the uh, bridge that gives you the most value on the other side. Uh, and so that is c currently hop for this current transfer. Uh, it tells you how much you're going to pay in gas, how long it's going to take. Uh, the next best bridge after that is the actual canonical optimism chain. Below that, you have hyphen bridge. Below that, you have across. Below that, you have multi chain bridge. There's all these different bridges, it's all like so many different ways to get to optimism. It does, does the security of your assets on Optimism depend on any of these bridges that you take over there? And the answer is no. No, it does not. The only thing that matters is the canonical Optimism bridge because once you get over to Optimism, the only security dependency that you have is the actual canonical Optimism bridge. Uh, and so once, once you have Ether on Optimism, the bridge that you use to get there can break and you still have Ether on Optimism. It's not beholden to that particular bridge. And this is only true for layer twos on Ethereum. This is not true for cross layer one bridges. If you are a cross layer one bridge, a multi-sig bridge to like Ethereum to Solana or Ethereum to Avalanche, then you are beholden to whatever bridge that you use to get there. But then you could, so you could bridge your Ether from like Ethereum to like Avalanche, and then you could trade that Ether for the AVAX token. And then you are no longer beholden to that bridge because you sold that risk off to somebody else. Um, and so this is a really good just like lesson in just like bridge risk. For, if, for all layer twos, if you're on Arbitrum the, and you have your Arbitrum Ether, you only are at risk of the canonical Arbitrum bridge, not the bridge that you use to get there. That's really cool, David. So, like, um, yeah, good, good overview here. So, you can cross with whatever, like, you can cross with whatever janky bridge, right? Like, you need to. It could be any bridge entirely, mm -hmm. as long as the Optimism bridge itself remains intact. Mm -hmm. You are fine. There is still bridge risk right. in that the optimism bridge itself, the canonical bridge could go down. But if mm -hmm. like you cross over to the island on some bridge that looks like something like this, this right. janky sort of like it's got holes in the middle of it right. and it's just rope and like pieces of, of, of wood, uh, as long as the main optimism bridge stays intact, all the other bridges could collapse, you will be fine. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And there, there is bridge risk. So if you're using hop to go from Ethereum to optimism, there's bridge risk while your assets are like in flight, while yes. like you're, they're yes. out of your Ethereum wallet and they have not yet landed minutes. in your optimism wallet. Yeah, 20 minutes or less. Usually it's less. Uh, once, it's, once it lands on optimism, then the only bridge that you have risk to is the actual canonical optimism bridge. Very cool. Here's another question. Cool. If I stake one minute after the merge, am I allowed to unstake whenever I want or I'm, am I subjected to the same waiting time to unstake of who staked before the merge? You, sir, or yes, sir, Damn. Matt, are beholden to the same wait times. Withdrawals are, un, are not enabled for anyone staking their Ether for six to 12 months after the merge. So even after the merge happens, if you begin staking, then you do not, you are not able to withdraw. You are still stuck like everyone else. Uh, six to 12 months, and then there will be some sort of software upgrade, a yep. fork, and Another then fork. everyone yep. will be able to unstake at once. But nope. until that nope. time... Nope, no, nope. they will not be able to uh, unstake be a waiting at once. There is, there is a, a, queue. a queue, yes. But uh, like I, everyone can start the process Everyone of can enter the queue to, to unstake, yes. That's a good clarification. Yes. So we're all in the same boat together. We're all like staking until that next fork happens, mm -hmm. which by the way, is pretty bullish for ETH price. <laughs> it's really so, like, bullish. It's a one-way ticket. <laughs> Speaking of one-way tickets, fam. Um, all right, let's get to some takes of the week. Takes this of the week. one from Polenia. Polenia. Polenia coming to the podcast again on Monday. But yes. what is Polenia saying here? This is a governance post. Yeah, so Polenia actually pr produces a governance post per optimism. Uh, this is one of the uh, few like governing things that Polenia does and says uh, he, they introduce a proposal to pause governance funding voting cycles until some level of optimism layer two decentralization has been achieved. So what Polenia is really saying is that we should stop distributing the OP token, stop doing rewards, stop doing governance proposals 
until optimism is more decentralized. And they cite regulatory risk um, the, uh, as a, the, one of the big reasons behind this. So they're just saying, hey, let's make sure the actual thing, optimism, is more decentralized than it currently is before we start paying out OP tokens as like reward incentives. So, you know, kind of a contrarian take, but this is kind of why we appreciate Polenia because they are very just clear and sober minded. Uh, and Polenia being a good governor too. This is a pretty yes. detailed post uh, yeah. about this too. Uh, I think I am staking to Polenia, uh, Polenia on yeah. uh, the optimistic As am I. As am I. Think. I. Oh, cool. This is a take from Ryan Anderson. He says, the NFT space is like cavemen inventing the wheel and then only using it for roulette. <laughs> and that is a valid use of a wheel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you think there will be some non-speculative NFT cases, uh, use cases in the future in the next, um, next bull run? Next I, I know of a project right? that's working on right now, Ryan. Utility NFTs, baby. Yeah, utility NFTs. I was like, token gated yes. access. Do you remember when ICOs were just basically speculative tools? Right. And like that. I, I remember when ICOs right. were the future. Tokens <laughs> were, right? Like tokens, tokens yeah. did nothing. They were completely right. stupid and useless in 2017. And it was only during the, the, the bear market. Mm-hmm. By the way, are, are we in a bear market still? Do we still I don't say think that? So. I don't think so. God, the bear market didn't last very long. No, it really we're didn't. We're trying to brand this thing the build market. And like, yeah. if we're already done, then I guess all that work is <laughs> over. Yeah, that's actually a good point. We should have, we should, it'd be nice to have the bear market for a little bit longer just to really put a fire in people's ass. I don't think we're full bull yet. I think we'll crab for a while. I think a merge will be catalyst. Yeah, crab but, between so. three and 2,000. The crab market's not, doesn't sound well. Good though. It's either bull or bear. There's no yeah. in between. Right. Um, all right, this is another take. Uh, I can't read my own takes. Ryan, Ryan shot out his classic angry. take. Ryan <laughs> says, I hear bad people use the internet. Let's just ban TCP, IP, and SSL and be done with it. And uh, Funk9871, a uh, Funk is a backwards punk. Uh, they, uh, they say, especially SSL. Do you know what SSL stands for? Secure Sockets Layer yeah, is a standard security layer. technology for est- establishing an encrypted link between a server and a client, basically a website. Okay, cool. It's, okay, and so Funk9871 says, especially SSL, you can have military-grade encrypted communication with servers? Scaredy face. Imagine what could be wired there. Pedophiles, instructions for bomb building, conspiracy theories, hate speech. We need to censor this. Yeah, also your transaction and credit card data. Let's make sure that that stays like open for the, all of the internet to watch. No thanks. Uh, exactly. A, a, exactly the point. So it's like, what, what do we do? We just ban everything? Right. Uh, I mean, we need privacy. We're going to have digital uh, crypto technology. By, by the way, what does this say for the central bank digital currency? Right? Do, do, you, do you think Treasury is going to want to enable privacy by default on that thing, the central right. bank digital currency? No. no, no. They're not going to no. give you privacy. They're going to want to backdoor into everything. This is why, like, the, in a CBDC, there would also never be, like, a public accessible virtual machine because then you nope. could build Tornado Cash on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? So they're going to hamstring the whole thing, which is, right. uh, I, th- I guess, the bull case for crypto. But um, I guess your take is, David, it's all going to work out okay, right? It's all going to work out okay. Have faith. Right. you got to have faith. Go. Uh, all right. <laughs> this one's great. You, you zoom out a little bit. Is this, this is the a, meme of the week? No, we're not in the meme stage No, this yet. is, this is, well, we had two memes of the week and this is the one that we put in the take section. <laughs> uh, the, the tweet, the tweet says inflation is down 0.2% to 8.5%. Second worst recorded, uh, inflation ever. And then the picture goes crypto MFers. And then it's the picture of the hangover <laughs> and they're all gambling at the roulette table. It's like, so yes, excited. inflation's down 0.2%. Let's go to the casino. <laughs> it is. I'm surprised the market reacts. <laughs> so bullishly to this like spec tiny tiny micro spec of good news but <laughs> such is the market all right david uh close us out man what, what are you bullish on this week <laughs> can i really say anything other than ethereum right now like we just scheduled the merge, the merge? bro You're, okay yeah. so this is something i always think is super ironic in 2017 that bull market got the ethereum bull market was partially catalyzed by everyone wanting to buy ether so they could stake it and that was me i was like oh god i get as much ether as i can get passive income so, baby yeah passive income because they're the going to go to proof of stake in 2018 uh and then 2018 came and like the roadmap just like was not defined and then we went into a bear market and then like DeFi summer hit and it was like oh yeah like proof of stake by the end of 2020 like oh my god i've got to get as much ether as i can so like so i can stake it and at the end of 2020 and then like that came and went and then like now we're into the second the last part of 2022 and we actually have it scheduled it's That's actually true. real this time it's actually happening now so instead of like being the catalyst for like a bull market that's actually happening right now it's a catalyst for a bull market that is completely proof of like ethereum proof of stake being driven right now so far which is no to be fair though david you could stake 
when the beacon chain went live. True. Sure. Right, sure. which is True. a long time ago. But sure. you've been, have you been waiting with the bulk of your ETH for, yeah. for kind of the yeah. merge? No, my, my, the bulk of my ETH is not on the beacon chain. Are you yeah, going to start staking like post, post merge? Is that your catalyst? Or are you going to wait for the, um, the next fork where you can actually withdraw? Um, I was, uh, that's a really good question. I have not seriously considered that. You haven't that. thought about what you're going to stake not, or how much. Yeah. You know what we need, David? Yeah. Do you remember that episode we did on uh, how much ETH can you retire on? A right. long time ago, right, right. How Where much was that? I think it was like I think it was just like a little over hundred ETH. I mean, to get a sixty thousand dollar this had, this had a sixty thousand dollar a year salary off of a hundred ETH. This was before we had two years of like twenty percent each uh, year inflation, but or yeah. like you know, like massive inflation. So maybe it's a bit this was, now. that was also assuming a five thousand dollar ETH price as well. But we'll oh. get there too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> how much? It's, the conversation's back, baby. Yeah. Passing okay. Income. So like it, it, the the merge is scheduled. Inflation down. No. Hopefully that continues. Uh, L two tokens are up. Fee tokens are up. Like not only is ETH bullish and proof of stake bullish, but tokens are also bullish. The tokens are having a great moment right now. So like people are feeling good about stuff. And I'm hoping, Ryan, that that makes people feel better about stuff in the future. <laughs> and I then we can have a bull market. Huh? Here's a picture for you. <laughs> Which of these people are you, okay? <laughs> the one missing the tooth. <laughs> I'm showing the, handover, the hangover, the hangover picture, uh, picture again. again. Yeah. 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 That's it. That's us right now. What, which tokens have I put my, uh, my, my, get my bets on? <laughs> Ryan, what are you bullish on? Um, I was listening to the Blodgy episode again, the, the episode that came out this Monday, uh, the one on Nations. Mm -hmm. And then, like, in the backdrop of an actual nation state banning a privacy protocol, banning code, banning effectively speech, right? Uh, it went back to, like, what am I bullish on? Nations. And the way Balaji defined it is nation is different than a nation state. Mm -hmm. a nation is a community. It's a tribe of people. Uh, the Wikipedia definition is a community of people formed on the basis of a combination of shared features, such as language, history, culture, territory, belief, nations. What are nations? They are communities. That is not the nation state. But I feel like the nation state has kind of conflated those two together. And they want uh, the word nations to actually mean this nation state type right. thing. And it's different. It's right. different because we can have these things that are internet na nations, digital nations. Uh, and I think this unlocks something big for communities for societies, for groups of individual with, with, with shared beliefs. Uh, and uh, this opens up an avenue for humans coordinating outside of the nation state. At first, the nation states are, I think, going to feel a little threatened by this. We're starting to see some of that. Right. Like, feeling threatened. We don't know what to do with this new thing. You're not, a, if, you're not a nation. You don't have a flag. You don't have <laughs> rights. You don't, like, you can't, you're, you're creating your own money. Right. That's not real money. It's fake right. internet money. And, like, you're not, and, and It'll take time, right. uh, but the thing that the things that we will build in this new digital nation, internet nation, will be different than the nation state, and I think will be complementary to it uh, over time. Uh, and I can't wait to start unlocking some of those mm -hmm. new, new things. Blasi said in our episode, he's like, "The twenty tens, uh, we discovered internet money. The twenty twenties are going to be about discovering internet nations," and uh, I, I think that is a a big thing we're going to like define and uncover and start to see use cases for this decade. I think mean, people people have a hard time I think imagining this right now in the same way that it's very yeah. difficult to imagine a crypto uh, internet money back in 2011. You have to have like a big broad imagination. But um, I think that's it, man. We're we're in the process of defining it. and like what I love going back to is like you remember Blasi was talking about. Sometimes you have to go back in order to go forward. Right. right. I, I find myself being very attracted to like some of the founding principles of nation states, right? Mm, like you, yeah. you go back to kind of like the Federalist Papers and like the United States Constitution. And like, those are the base principles right. for they got how it humans right. want to live. They got that right. Yeah. And they built a protocol called a state around that. And that's cool. Mm -hmm. But like some of these base principles, um, we can manifest the core base principles of um, life, liberties, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in internet protocols. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like? Anyway, uh, I think we're in this new era of of nation builders. Yeah, I think right? I think you're saying you're bullish on nations without states. Yes, nations without states. Very very careful not to stay nation yeah. states. I'm bullish right. just on nations, just and on specifically nations. internet nations. Right, so that is bullish on small communities of people. Yeah, um, I think that means you're bullish on Discord channels. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Discord channels. Discord you know, channels. I mean, I said I was bullish on tokens. I think you just said what I meant in a different way. <laughs> yes. Well, you're <laughs> bullish on their assets, all right? These, I'm, I'm bullish on the abstract flags, idea. But they yeah. do have tokens. <laughs> I think Balaji just thing. nailed it, man. I, yeah. I just, uh, it's a good episode. Anyway, yeah, totally. um, but what do we got for Meme of the Week? Meme of the Week. Let's do it. Let's cook it up. I am sharing a picture of trains and yeah, so, Godzilla. Yeah, so this is my, this, uh, the reason why I love this uh, train. Godzilla, where did you get Godzilla? I don't know. It's blurred. What is that thing <laughs> no, on the that's track? one of those things that like ends a train from pr- going off the track. What? Okay, so- that's not like a Balrog or a win- winged beast thing? What are you looking at, man? <laughs> what is did you this? watch a bunch of Lord of the Rings with your kids on vacation? <laughs> Actually, it's just I did. like a barrier. It's like a wooden barrier because that's the end of the train track. Okay, we okay. watched it. This is a, a Back to the Future movie uh, where they go back and uh, is this Back to the Future number one? I think it might be. It maybe might number two. I can't remember. Anyways, this is when they have to get their car up to eighty-eight miles an hour using a train. Yes, it's three. Uh, and so, back to the Future three. That's Back to the Future three. Okay, so then they get they Wild get the, they get the DeLorean up to eighty-eight miles an hour. And so then it disappears and goes back to the future. And that is the merge. The merge is when like the Ethereum chain disappears from the proof of the big, <laughs> slow, chunky proof of work train. And then it disappears. And then it goes to the proof of stake chain, which is the future. And then the proof of work train literally goes off of the track and crashes and burns. And this is why I've been calling the DeFi ecosystem on the proof of work chain is dividing by zero. Once the Ethereum chain leaves proof of work and goes to proof of stake, the proof of work chain crashes. It goes off the bridge. It dies. Uh, and this is a great meme that, that encapsulates this. There you go. It's Back to the Future. Nothing to do with dragons or Lord of the Rings or whatever else <laughs> no. I said. And But this does look like it's from a video game. Am I right about this? Or oh, yeah. are these 80s, actual 80s, scenes from a movie? 80s animation, bro. That's 80s animation? Well, it looks when, so when terrible. When did Back to the Future come out? It's 80s, yeah, for sure. 1985, yeah. Man, all right. How time flies. Uh, that's it for this week, guys. As always, none of this has been financial advice. Never is on It wasn't, wasn't legal advice either. It wasn't legal cash. advice uh, whatsoever, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.